Morning Leadership, eight mentoring sessions you can't afford to miss. The third Monday, Escape from Management Land. Good morning, Jeff. Tony met me at the door for a third Monday morning meeting, looking as fresh as dapper as ever. You're on time and appear to be in a much better mood this week. I hope things are getting a little better at work. Well, I spent a lot of time on the three questions that I left here with last week. I said, much of my frustration has been not knowing what the problem was, much less what to do to fix it. I think I've made some real progress this week. First, I tackled the resignation issue head on. I reviewed Jenny's and Chad's exit interviews. They both resigned during the past couple of months. And just as I expected, the exit interviews didn't reveal much information. In fact, if you read each of the exit interviews without knowing what they were, you'd think both employees were happy to be working here. Taking my search a step further, I talked to a few people on my team. And while they were reluctant to speak for their former teammates, at first, one person, Michael, provided some interesting information, I reported. Michael said neither Jenny or Chad really wanted to leave, but they were unhappy about things that had been going on in the company. Michael also reminded me both Jenny and Chad received increases in pay shortly before the resignations, so pay had little to do with their decisions to leave. Your words from last week kept ringing in my ears. People normally quit because their manager is not meeting their needs. People quit people before they quit companies. Well, I still felt some circumstance was the reason they left. Not me or something I did, I admitted, but I knew you wouldn't buy that answer. So I went to see both Chad and Jenny. I met with them each individually, and since they no longer work for me, there was no reason for them to not tell the truth. I'll say up front. Both seemed surprised I was interested enough to see them, and they opened up more than I expected. I was shocked by what I heard. Well, they didn't come right out and say it, but I left knowing that they didn't leave the company. They left me their manager. Just as you said, I wasn't meeting their needs. So during my visit with each of them, I took a lot of time trying to understand what needs I hadn't meet. Basically, it came down to three things. First, hire good employees. Their perception was I had gotten lazy in my hiring. In fact, one of them said, that if a person could fog a mirror, I would select them for our team. The problem was my good employees were being asked to do more and more, while others were being asked to do less and less. Chad even said some of us felt abused because we're good employees. Honestly, Tony, I couldn't believe what they were saying. Could I really be punishing the good employees by giving them more work and rewarding the lower performing employees by allowing them to do less? Both Chad and Jenny thought so and thought so enough to leave. Second, coach every member of the team to become better. I walked away from both meetings upset with myself. I hadn't provided adequate feedback and direction to either of these employees. Employees I considered among my best. Really, I assume, I know what they say about assuming anything. They were happy working without much feedback. I think I let them down by not paying enough attention to their individual needs. And third, dehire the people who aren't carrying their share of the load. I told you before our performance issues I had ignored. Well, those performance issues had an effect on the rest of the team. Jenny said what began as one negative and cynical employee 
became a whole team of negative and cynical employees. She said they kept looking to me to fix the problem, but I allowed to go on. I did nothing. Needless to say, Tony, I was humbled after my meetings with Chad and Jenny. I was also a little relieved. At least I know now there are things I can do to avoid losing more good employees. I combined the other two questions you asked me to address into one. What is one main thing, the main purpose for our team? Wednesday, I had a meeting with my team. I prepared a paper for each team member to complete. On the paper was one sentence. The main thing in our department is, and each person was asked to fill in the blank. Well, I know you won't be surprised by their answers, and really, neither was I. No one knew what the main thing was. Oh, everyone had an answer, but there was no consistency. This exercise showed me that instead of clearly defined goals and expectations, we had mass confusion about our most important mission as a team. So now I know our team has some work to do to define and understand the main thing. But it seemed as though everyone felt good about having some direction established. I also had a good meeting with Karen. I think she appreciated me taking the initiative to meet with her. We still have a way to go, but I'm making it a priority to manage that relationship better. And yeah, I am in a better mood this week. I've realized there are things that I control that have contributed to my frustrations and the team's frustration. Even though last week was not an ego builder because of some of the answers I received, I do feel better. Now I can know there's something that can be done. And it's something I can do, I confessed. Wonderful, Tony exclaimed. Although, without surprise, you made some great strides this week, and I'm proud of you. But it sounds like one of the things you discovered is that one of the main things for a leader is to eliminate confusion. We'll talk later on about confusion, which can paralyze your team but you've taken a giant step by working with your team to figure out what the main things are in your department. My mentor continued, obviously pleased with my report this Monday. Something that may have contributed to the confusion on the team is a trap many managers fall into, he said. This trap is what I call management land, where things are not always as they seem. And there's something else about this place. Sometimes it's difficult to escape management land. In management land, simple things often become complex and people easily love perspective. Managers began to think the games other play are what are most important. In management land, people are rewarded for saying only the things managers want to hear Egos are big and it's difficult to discover the truth. Management land can be described as confusing, frustrating, and sometimes comical to those on the outside. What you learned this week is that you have to escape from management land and get in touch with your people. Chad and Jenny were right on the mark when they said that their expectations of you were simple. Hire good people, coach everyone to become better and de-hire the ones who don't pull their share of the load. Jeff, their expectations actually translate into great device. Let's look at it this way. On most teams, there are three types of employees. Some are superstars, people who have the experience, knowledge, and desire to be the very best at their jobs. Others are middle stars. They may not have the experience to be a superstar yet. Or maybe they are former superstars who for some reason lost their motivation to be the best. And then there are those I call falling stars. Those are the ones who are doing as little as they can get away with. A typical team has about 30% superstars, 50% middle stars, and 20% falling stars. If you keep pilling more work on your superstars, like Chad and Jenny suggested you had done, then you shouldn't expect them to continue to be superstars. Oh, sure, 
Some superstars will always be superstars, regardless of their workload. But others will be beaten down into middle stars because of the additional work you pile on. Take a look at this chart. Tony Pierce. 30% superstars, 50% middle stars, 20% falling stars. Where is the minimum acceptable level of performance represented on this chart? Of course, I said, that's pretty simple. The minimum acceptable performance is in the middle of the 50%, right here. 30% superstars, 50% middle stars, 20% falling stars. No, Jeff, the minimum acceptable performance is actually here, at the bottom of the 20%, Tony corrected. Not here, here, at the falling stars. You see, the people at the very bottom of the chart are still on your team. So their behavior must be acceptable to you. In fact, many managers, and you probably know some of these people, actually reward their falling stars by giving them less work while acknowledging them with decent performance reviews. When you do that, you should expect more people to fall into that category. Why not do less when there are still rewards? Your job is not to lower the bottom by adjusting for and accommodating the lowest performing employees. You should be raising the top by recognizing and rewarding superstar behaviors. You simply cannot ignore performance issues and expect your superstars to stick around for very long. Tony was empathetic about this point. That's what Chad and Jenny were telling you. They said they needed you to coach everyone on the team and to hire those who didn't carry their share of the load. I want you to try this. Write in your spiral notebook the name of each team member and then categorize them as superstars, middle stars or falling stars and include Jenny and Chad as well. That's pretty easy, I said. I definitely know my superstars and falling stars. I guess everyone else is a middle star. So I'd identified six superstars, including Jenny and Chad. Three team members are falling stars and eight are middle stars. Okay, said Tony. Now I want you to take that back to your office. Go to your files and retrieve every person's most recent performance review. Then put their most recent performance review score next to their name. Next, pull their personal file. Beside each name, note each time that you've documented some kind of recognition or performance improvement over the past six months. It could be a letter of appreciation or a performance improvement document. Please bring that sheet with you next week. Well, once again, we're out of time, Jeff. But you're making some great progress, and I appreciate you taking our session seriously," Tony said with a smile. Oh, and by the way, I am enjoying my time with you as well. So tell me, what are you going to do before we meet next week? Well, I'm going to focus on several things I began. First, I will complete the superstars, middle stars, and falling stars exercise. That may be interesting. Second, I will continue my team's discussion on identifying the main things so we can begin eliminating confusion. Third, I'm going to work with human resources to start interviewing to fill the positions that are open. And finally, I'll begin the process of coaching my employees. But I need your help in this area. I'm not sure exactly how to do that. Great, you've got some work to do. And it sounds like you've already started thinking about our next meeting. I will be honored to help you on the coaching part. We can work on that next week. See you next week. Get out of management land. Get in touch with your people. Your job is not to lower the bottom by adjusting and accommodating the falling stars. You should be raising the top by recognizing and rewarding superstars' behaviors. If you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.